Gentlemen, welcome to the Royal Armouries. My name is David, I'm part of the education team, and today I'm going to be taking you along to our Civil War gallery where I'll be inducting a tour. Looking at some of the soldiers we find on the English Civil War battlefield, we're going to start off by looking at our cavalrymen, the men that charged in on horseback, and we're going to start off by looking at the heavy cavalry, which is over here. Now, the heavy cavalry was known as the Cuirassier, and they look a lot like medieval knights, and you'd be right in thinking that. Uh, it's very, very similar in armour styles. However, there are some big differences. The biggest difference being this armour here is in fact musket ball proof, unlike that of the medieval knight. How do we know it's musket ball proof? Well, they write it down for us. It's very helpful. It's all their books and letters. But if you need to see the evidence yourself, you can even see the dents upon the armour. Now on this one over here, there are two dents upon the breastplate. But interestingly enough, there's one on here as well. A dent on the breastplate and one on either tacit. Now, true, this could be the result of some remarkable marksmanship by some savvy musketeer on the battlefield. However, we think it's from a process known as proofing. What is proofing? Well, proofing is when your armour is put to its test. You see, this stuff here costs you a great deal of money, a huge investment. And, well, you want to know it works before you hand over your cash. So, you will ask the armourer to prove it. To do this, he'll bring the armour out in front of you, he will draw his pistol, he'll point it point blank at the armour he's just made you, and bang! You will shoot that arm. Now, if it bounces off, fantastic. Hand over the cash, march off to battle knowing that you're well protected. Uh, if it goes through, well, um, ask for a discount, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, if you're lugging this stuff around and it's not protecting you, it's really a lot of dead weight. Most of these armors will weigh anywhere between five to seven stone. An incredible weight to be lugging around the battlefield. Now, there's a fantastic story about how unstoppable a cuirassier could be on the battlefield. And this comes from a man known as Richard Atkins. Now, Richard Atkins is a royalist cavalryman, and he is charging towards the parliamentarian cuirassiers, and he spots the enemy general of cavalry. So as he charges towards the cavalryman, the general draws his first pistol, shoots at Richard, and misses. So the general draws his second pistol, shoots at Richard again. He misses again. Now Richard, being clever, waits to the very last moment. He charges into the general, places the pistol against the chest, and fires point blank into him. He then pulls the pistol away and rides off thinking that he's got his man. However, when he turns around, oh, he finds the general is completely unharmed. So, of course, he takes his second pistol, he draws it, BANG! The musket ball bounces clean off. So if this armour is so unstoppable, why, uh, say why, uh, is it disappearing within a year or so of the English Civil War? Well, it's for two reasons really, and we touched upon both. Far few men, far fewer men could afford it, uh, and far fewer men could wear it. Uh, it's incredibly heavy, it's incredibly expensive, and it just falls out of favour really. Now this leads to them making changes to their armour. They decided to make it cheaper and lighter by removing the arms, removing the tacits, by redesigning the helmet, and we end up with the light cavalry, otherwise known as the harquebusier. The harquebusier has a breastplate, still musket ball proof, just a lot less of it. There's a new type of helmet known as a three bar pot because of the one, two, three bars on the face, and it's also introducing what is known as a buff coat. Now, the buff coat is a very thick leather jacket, it's superb against swords. You cannot cut through it, but it is not very good against a musket ball. In fact, you get hit by a musket ball, it'll go into you, out of you, and drag half the coat through you. Uh, it's really unpleasant. However, you are cheaper, you are lighter, you are more manoeuvrable, and this became the far more popular type of armour that you would find on the Civil War battlefield. So, we've spoken about a lot of the armour here, but two of my favourite pieces of armour in this cabinet are these two things down here. We've got a dome there and a disc there. And you'll be forgiven to have walked past those without even looking at them. They're very boring looking. Uh, however, they're very interesting. They are both known as secrets. And their job is for one thing and one thing alone. And that is to look good. You see, if you want to look your best on the English Civil War battlefield, you must take your largest and featheriest hat. However, as you can imagine, not very good against a sword, even worse against a musket. So what you do is you take your secret made out of iron or steel, you place it upon your head, you place your hat upon the secret, and voila! You can ride into battle looking absolutely gorgeous, but knowing that you've got a little bit of head protection as well. And it is strictly a fashion item. That three bar part is going to protect you far better than that secret, but you won't look half as good in the portraits. Now, we've spoken about the armour, what about the weapons? Well, the cavalrymen were riding in using 
pistols and carbines and blunderbusses. These were the new lance for the cavalrymen of the English Civil War. Now, the pistol they were using is quite simple, but quite long-winded when it comes to explaining how it works. So the first thing you need to do with a flintlock pistol of the time period is to load it. And to load it, you need to first pull back the hammer to half cock, which is where the saying comes from, going off half cocked. And that enables you to load the pistol without the trigger being sensitive. It means that you'll never ever fire it in this position. Now that exposes your pan, which is this bit here. Now the pan, you'll fill with your priming powder. Once you've done that, you'll close your pan cover. And now that protects your priming powder from getting blown away by the wind, stops it getting wet in the rain, stops it falling out, when well, you do this. And you've got to do this to carry on reloading your weapon. Now once you've done that, you're going to take more gunpowder known as your charge, place it down the barrel, take a musket ball, which is about the size of a Malteser, made out of lead, put that down the barrel, and then last but not least, take a bit of wadding or a bit of cloth and you place that down the barrel too. Now you remove the scouring stick, spin it round, pop it in the barrel and ram the charge home. Do it with the thumb and the finger, not with the fist. You do it with the fist and the thing goes off, you end up with a stick through your hand. So remove it as well, that's a very important part of the whole process, because you can fire the pistol with the scouring stick in there. You will skewer a guy spectacularly. However, you won't be able to reload your weapon, and quite frankly, uh, if this didn't belong to you, which more often than not it didn't, you might be asked to go and get the scouring stick back. And that is not a job you want. So put it back where you found it, underneath the barrel, and now the weapon is pretty much ready to fire. There's only one last thing you need to do, and that is pull the hammer back to full cock. There we go. Now, of course, there's no gunpowder, there's no explosive, so hopefully we won't get anything more than a spark. If we do, sorry. There we go. So that spark was caused by the flint striking the frizzle, which is that tall bit of steel there, and it's the spark that will ignite your priming powder. It burns through a tiny hole known as a touch hole, and then it will ignite your charge. And bang! You've shot your man, hopefully. Now, if I was to take this pistol, and I have to stand all the way over here, try and shoot that buff coat in that cabinet from this distance. I'd almost certainly miss. And that's not because I'm a bad shot. Ignore the front of house staff, they spread nasty rumours, okay? It's because this thing here is only effective to 10 yards at best. That's why in our story, Richard places it against the man's chest because it's the only way to guarantee a hit. <laughs> now once they're shot, they're shot. You might have a couple of them stored on your saddle, maybe one tucked in your boot. But there's only one thing left to do once you run out of pistols, and that is to draw your sword. Now we have two types of sword during the English Civil War. We have our rapier, which is the tall slender sword at the top there, and we have our back sword, which is the chunkier sword at the bottom. Now by my side, I've got a back sword. Now the back sword is a hacking, slashing weapon. It's very weighted in the blade and it has a very thick spine or back to it, enabling you to get a great deal of weight and inertia when you come crashing down upon your opponents from the back of a horse. It has got a basket hilt upon it, which enables your hand to be very well protected, but it does stop you from using the blade in any other direction, which is another reason why you've only got that single blade to it, rather than the earlier medieval swords that had two edges to them. Now this sword, like I said, is designed for slicing through your opponent, and that is very good because you've got a large surface area, it means you're more likely to hit your mark. Problem is, you're dealing with buff coats. You're dealing with armor which is designed to stop cutting weapons. Now you might be able to cut into that buff coat, but you won't cut through it. You might break the man's bones underneath it, but he's still gonna be attached. Uh, and that three bar pop, well those three bars are designed to stop blades coming across the face. And well, quite frankly, you could hack and slash a carassier all day, and well, they'll simply laugh at you. There's no way you're chopping your way through them. And that's where the rapier comes in. Now the rapier is much more slender more delicate of a sword. However, with the correct training, uh, you can use it very accurately and is designed not for the cut, but for the thrust. That means you can easily get into the free bar pot. You can even, with enough skill, bypass the visor of a cuirassier, maybe going for the elbow or uh, in between the legs. Not very chivalrous, but it works. Now, the downside to the rapier is that it's quite a slender, delicate sword, and if you are sparring with a back sword, you will struggle to parry the blows. The back sword is a little bit heavier. But with the right amount of skill, you should be able to get past all that. Another no thing to note is that the rapier is far more fashionable. So if you want to look your best for that beautiful portrait that you've had commissioned, wear your secret, wear your hat, take your rapier, and you will look fabulous for years to come. <laughs>